So, are we going to be thrown out at six? Sorry? Are we going to be thrown out at six o'clock? Uh, you have 15 minutes. Oh, okay. No problem. Okay. Good. Uh, thanks for staying, staying on. Uh, this is a progress report on the project that I've been presented also in the previous EAA in uh, Maastricht. Um, today, uh, me and my co-author would like to present the status quo of a study that began in 2016 with a pilot product project supported by the Netherlands Royal Academy of Sciences, uh, aimed at improving the quality of archives, archaeological field walking or survey data sets. So they become reusable in practice and not just in theory, as I will try to convince you in a later slide. Although this work was mainly concerned with archaeological field survey data, particularly from the Mediterranean area, uh, this topic has a much broader relevance that we want to present and discuss here. Uh, firstly, we all have a moral obligation uh, to ensure that our research data remains available and reusable by other researchers in the long run. Uh, so we cannot dump it into some repository uh, in such a form that nobody can actually do anything with it. Uh, and secondly, we have funding bodies, research funding bodies, uh, as well as our own employers, the university, who require that we take measures to safeguard the data that we produce uh, and that we deposit them somewhere where they can be checked um, for, for truth, I guess, if, if necessary. So this is referring to something that happened in the Netherlands where we have a major case of fraud and the government decided that research data now have to be put somewhere where somebody could check that they are not based on some fraudulent um, action by the researcher. Um, unlike in some of the hard sciences, we as archaeologists have, tend to have quite individual approaches to producing and storing data, and this leads to great problems if we want to share and even merge data sets. So if we don't understand properly the structure and meaning of other researchers' data sets, then we are unable to join these data and query them in any interesting way. Skip that one. So, um, I'm probably preaching to the converted in this room, but I want to keep the next, uh, to use the next few slides uh, to remind us of the, of the corner that we have painted ourselves in uh, as field survey archaeologists. We are unable to effectively share and merge our data sets. Um, thinking about archiving data sets uh, has crystallized around this acronym FAIR. Uh, so your archive, your digital archive must be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And the first two of these only ensure that the data can be found somewhere and accessed. Uh, it doesn't ensure that we can do anything useful with it. Uh, the latter two, interoperability and reusability, are supposed to ensure that those data will make sense to other people uh, and that there are no technical obstacles preventing them from being reused. Um, just to illustrate this, uh, um, I'm using some current archiving practices. Currently, the Dutch Institutional Digital Repository for Archaeologists is uh, with DANS, Data Archiving Network Services. That's an institute run by the Royal Academy um, that's responsible for the management and sustainable maintenance of digital data archives. Within DANS, uh, there is the so-called e-depot for Dutch archaeology, Etna. And here we have a look inside Etna. So this is the Etna starting page for one of the Italian data sets deposited by my institute. So just a general description of the, of the project. Here's the description, which uses the 15 Dublin metadata descriptors of that project. Uh, and, and finally, here we have about two, 725 individual data files produced by that project. Uh, and this is what the archive is composed of. So this particular archive is findable through the website of Etna. The data is accessible if you have the proper rights as an academic uh, scientist. Uh, but the interesting thing is nobody has ever requested this data set. 
to do anything useful with it, except us, because we would run a test on it. So why has nobody requested this? Uh, and that is, I think, because other people's data are a pick to work with. I think you gave an example earlier on, uh, and you basically you give up after a while because it's too difficult. When we requested uh, another survey archive from Aetna to investigate whether the information supplied would allow us to understand the data set, we, were, we very quickly had to give up. So current best practice, as shown by this Aetna system, uh, can be described as fulfilling the FA principles, but not the IR principles. Okay. If we look at this internationally, we can point to, uh, for example, something called Fasti Online, which is a service built on what used to be called Magis. Um, here we have uh, Many other groups and organizations have produced survey data in the last 50 years, and it would seem logical that those data should somehow be mergeable and reusable for large-scale analysis. This FASTI Online database shows the status quo of archiving of field surveys in the Mediterranean area. Here we see Italy, for which some 120 projects have been recorded since the 1960s. Quite a large number. But many of these were never or only partially published. So the only thing we actually have here is a pointer to the fact that the project has, exists. Uh, fully digital survey archives are very rare. Some of our own surveys uh, and some other ones that I won't mention here. So uh, there's only a small number of actual archives available through this portal. So here the data appears to be findable, but mostly not accessible, let alone interoperable and reusable. So as a discipline or a sub-discipline, we are doing very poorly. Uh, the original CIDOC CRM from the museum world produced a relatively small set of concepts of general applicability. We've seen this diagram before, for example, actors and events. And domain experts have extended this um, system uh, using more specialized concepts. In this diagram, we have the visualization by the EU project Ariadne, which includes the various extensions that are of interest to archaeologists, uh, it, like inference making, uh, geographical uh, concepts, building architecture and excavation. And of course, if we want to do something with field survey, it should come in somewhere over there, preferably inside the uh, CRM Archeo extension. So, um, then we have to make a set of concepts uh, about survey archaeology. Uh, we started out with some test databases uh, containing field data and ceramic data gathered during recent uh, field surveys of our own institute in the University of Groningen in this in central Italy. Uh, these surveys has been, have been ongoing since the late 1980s, and the extent and intensity of this type of research has increased consider considerably since the, light, the late 1990s. So that now our department owns several different extensive data sets containing survey records. Uh, as you saw earlier, we don't believe that the dance archives contain de facto interoperable and reusable data sets. And luckily, we re received some funding in order to investigate steps in the direction of creating an ontology for, uh, for survey data. And I'll skip through this more quickly because you've seen similar material in earlier presentations already. We started out by trying to analyze what it actually is, what we're doing as survey archaeologists, so we can identify different types of activities that we undertake, different types of actors that do these things, places in which we do these things, and other types of concepts that seem to be necessary in order to describe fieldwalking surveys. And we visualize this in, the, in this kind of a process model, uh, which shows that we have three stages of research, let's say the actual field survey field work, which is the central part, then immediately follows, or even at the same time, by artifact studies. The artifacts that come out of the field are being processed by specialists. 
And then also at the same time or later on, there's a lot of data interpretation going on, very poorly controlled. Uh, um, but as one example, uh, it could be that sites are defined afterwards, so on the basis of the collected data of the, of the field survey. So that was our understanding of what we were doing. Uh, the next step would then be uh, to link somehow the concepts uh, that we have just found for ourselves to existing concepts in the CDOC CRM or its extensions. We don't want to invent all new concepts if there are existing concepts to, to use. So here is an example of uh, concepts, uh, a hierarchy of concepts in the CRM. And here we have our own view of the concepts and we try to link it to one to one or more of these existing concepts. So I won't go into details of this slide, it's just to show you the step in the process. Um, sometimes this works nice, you can immediately understand, okay, this is the concept that we need in order to describe this part of our own data, but in a lot of cases we have doubts or we completely don't know which concepts to use or we think we need completely new concepts to describe parts of our data. So. Uh, there is a number of issues to resolve, and these were discussed uh, briefly in a meeting earlier this year of the Special Interest Group for CRM. So, uh, I, in view of the time, I cannot uh, go through this in detail, just do one or two of these. Um, so, we have the problem that if you do field working, it's, you don't just make observations about a field, but you're also collecting things at the same time. So, you cannot say that Field, working, field walking is a type of observation. It's more complicated than that. Um, we have a lot of um, problems with the fact that we make temporary groups of, for example, of fines. Uh, let's say I have here 12, um, 12 Evra shirts. Uh, they come out of a bag of shirts. I, I actually make that group very temporarily uh, when I describe uh, all, the, all the finds in this bag. And when I finish describing them, I put the shirts back into the finds bag. So they are no longer a physical separate group. So we have temporary aggregates that exist very briefly, but we have also data about these temporary aggregates that we need to model somehow. So the, we don't know, so we put in the form of a question here how to deal with these. Okay, uh, so I skipped the more of these issues. Uh, I thought seven was a nice number to stop. Okay. Uh, so supposing that we can resolve all of this uh, with the help of the special interest group, uh, answer all of our questions, then the next step would be um, to map our own and other people's databases to this set of concepts. Uh, we haven't got very far with this yet, uh, but actually during this very conference I'm going to speak to three different survey data set owners and see how far we can get uh, with this mapping. So uh, I guess that means that in the next EAA I should be able to tell you more. So what does it mean to map? Well, basically you look at what is inside your own database and you define how that maps to existing CRM concepts. <coughs> So, for example, here's one of our own data tables, and in the, in the red ellipse, uh, you see some uh, detail. Let me see if I can find it quickly. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, the first three fields of this table that I show here contain information about the survey unit identifier, the type of survey unit, and the administrator responsible for taking notes. So, we would like to find the appropriate concepts for being able to share this data with colleagues. Our mapping document then defines the database field content, translated to appropriate CRM classes, and specifies the relationships between these things. Thus, the unit ID in our table called units is a so-called identifier E42, which identifies P1, a particular survey unit, which itself is a declarative place SP6. That is the process of mapping. Of course, I don't want to say that this is a correct mapping, this is an example of how you would map a little part of a survey database. 
Now, because I'm running out of time, uh, we go to the Outlook. And I'll do it like this. So as I said, we're currently testing our ideas on other people's data sets because we need to know whether they're sufficiently robust. If they work for us, we cannot be sure that they work for other people's data sets yet, so we have to test this. Um, also, uh, when we've done this, uh, we, we still haven't done anything useful. We have to be able to share the data with other people. So we need to take further steps to convert our own database into linked open data that can be accessed over the internet and merge with other people's data. Uh, thirdly, um, if we can do what we want to do uh, and make a good CRM Archeo uh, conceptual model, uh, then that could contribute to better archiving practices. So the current archives don't use any ontology, uh, and maybe we can sell this idea of an ontology to digital archives like Dance and Edna, and they can apply it to their own archiving. Uh, lastly, uh, already proposed last year in Maastricht, uh, uh, if we want to be successful in asking for more funding for um, developing uh, this conceptual reference model, but then it might be useful to obtain political support of the EAA. So I've been trying to get, uh, to get this support by mailing with the president and some of the secretaries. Didn't get anywhere so far, but I'm hoping to use this, this week here uh, to get one step further. Thanks very much. That's all we have time for.